evening. Uh, we'll start in Acts chapter 16. How about that? If you have your Bibles with you this evening, open with me. We're studying some, we're studying some um, alleged contradictions to Scripture, and it just so happens that we're into two or three here that, that deal with salvation. You know, I, I meant to do this. Uh, I'll do it now. Um, I want to respond to Jimmy's comments this morning. And, uh, and here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to pray for him and Denny to live for a long time. It's fair enough, right? So it sounds like as long as they're living, i got a job. So let me give you something else. You're already praying for them, I know. But, but pray for them to live a lot, lot longer than, than what God originally intended for them to live. To live even longer. The question is very simple. What must we do to be saved? Well, I don't envision tonight telling you anything you don't already know from the Scriptures. I grew up all of my life and hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. To which we've come along lately and we've added this sixth one, be faithful unto death. We start with passages like Hebrews chapter 1 and, or Hebrews chapter 11 rather in verse 6. Without faith it is impossible to please God. And we go to Romans 10 and verse 17 and we say, Now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Hear. Believe. We, we go there and we say, Well, you know, one of the most famous passages in Scripture, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 8 and verse 24, Unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. We move from there and we talk about repentance. And Jesus said in Luke 13, verses 3 and 5, Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. He said that twice in that same context. Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Perish. We'll move from there to passages like Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, and, and Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, and we talk about confession. We talk about how that if one believes with the heart and confesses with the mouth, then Jesus said, I will confess Him before the Father which is in heaven. Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, and quoted by Paul in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. And then we come to passages like, Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Repent and be baptized every one of you for the remission of your sins. We talk about baptism. We go to passages like Romans chapter 6. And we talk about being baptized into the death and the resurrection to walk a, to be brought up into a new life in Christ through baptism. We, we, we can quote these passages and, and, Go over them and over them, and perhaps we've been taught them all of our life. So I'm not, I'm not dare even thinking that, that I can share something new with you tonight to answer the question, what must we do to be saved? I think the Bible is very clear on that. Here's the alleged contradiction. The question is asked three times in recorded Scripture. Three times. David Killen has read all three times. But what he did not read to you was the answer. So let's start with the answers to the same question beginning in Acts 16. And I go to this one first on purpose. Acts 16 and verse 30, David read the question. But look at the answer in verse 31. Acts 16, 31, And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, I'll put all this in context in just a moment. You already know the context, but before we do that, back up to Acts chapter 2. already know this passage, but read it with me if you will. Same question, Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, and look at the answer in verse 38. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. In Acts 22 now, the third and final time that it is recorded. Of course, this is, Acts 22 really takes place in Acts chapter 9, right? Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 
And now why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Three different times the question is asked in recorded scriptures, and three different times the answer is different. Well, now wait a minute. You just read them with me. Don't tell me those three things said the same thing, because I know good and well they did not. I have a high school education, and I know how to read, thank you. And the three different times, there was three different answers to the same question. Uh-oh. So now let me ask you the question again. What must we do to be saved? Well, you can give me the cop out, and we can go home early if you want to. Well, the Bible answers that. You need to do it all. Okay, fair enough. All right? You got your answer. Now go home. You happy? But now think about it a little different with me for just a second. And I think this might help you to bring people to Christ. If you look at it and challenge your mind. I'm going to use Eric Klein's illustration from his book, but I'm going to change it for our sake tonight. I don't buy into the worldly lie that we're all going to heaven and there's a bunch of different ways to get there. I believe that is a lie of Satan because the Bible says otherwise. The Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and He is the only one. He uses the definite article, the. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 makes it very clear there is only one name by which we can be saved. And so I'm telling you tonight that I believe the Bible portrays a very different picture than the world. I believe heaven is a place that we are all trying to get to. Absolutely. And I believe there's only one route to take to get there. So follow me here in this illustration adapted from Eric Lyons' book. Let's say you were going to Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. You were traveling on Highway 43. You called me on my cell phone and you said, Hey, I'm coming up 43 North. How far am I from Lawrenceburg, Tennessee? Well, my question would be, Well, where are you? Well, I just came into St. Joe. Well, okay. You're about 18 miles from Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. Some time passes and you feel like you've been driving forever because the speed limit's changed 18 times. And you call me back. And you say, hey, Rodney, I'm traveling up 43 North, and I'm headed to Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. How far am I? I said, well, where are you? Well, I'm in Loretta, Tennessee. Well, if you've just come into Loretta, you're about 14 miles. If you're on the north end of Loretta, if you've been in it for a while, then you're about 11, 10, or 11 miles. Okay. A few minutes pass by, and you, you call me again. You say, okay, right now, about decided they've moved Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. How far am I from Lawrenceburg, Tennessee? Well, where are you? Well, I'm in Leoma, Tennessee. Oh, I know where that is. You're about five miles from Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. Now, did you ask me the same question three times? You did. You asked me, how far am I from Lawrenceburg, Tennessee? Did I give you three different answers? I absolutely did. 18, 14, and 5 are not the same answer. What changed? Your location changed. Your ge geographical location changed, and therefore, the answer changed. The destination did not change. The route did not change, and nowhere in the course of any of this did I lie to you. I gave you the answer that you asked for. So now, with that illustration then, go back to Acts chapter 16 with me. And think about this for a moment. In Acts chapter 16, put the question and the answer in its context. We have the Philippian jailer. We have Paul and Silas who have been in jail who have been in prison for preaching the gospel, who are at midnight singing and praying to God. When an earthquake breaks out and the bars are broken, to which all the stocks and the chains and Paul and the others with him could have got up and walked out, to which this jailer who had been charged with them with his life now, 
wakes up to this scene and says, Oh my, I am going to be killed because all of these prisoners have escaped and seeks to take his own life to which Paul says, Wait a minute, don't do it. We're all still here. I'm paraphrasing the text, but for time's sake, allow me to do so. You understand the story and the context. It's that that response then that the Philippian jailer says what David read from verse 30. Sirs, what must I do? He has just been given a gift that he don't even understand. But what he recognizes is that there is something. Remind yourself that before the earthquake, this man heard them singing and praying to the God of heaven. And now, lo and behold, they've had the opportunity to run out scotch-free, and they hadn't done it. He has, he's been moved by their actions And he asked this question, what must I do? To which we read the answer a while ago in verse 31. And the answer is straightforward. Believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That was the answer given to the Philippian jailer. And then the text goes on in verse 32. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him. And he took them, verse 33, the same hour of the night, washed their wounds, and he was baptized, he and all of his household. What's the point? The point is this. This guy is traveling to Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, and he's in St. Joe. That's where he's at. Folks, to someone who has no belief in God, you take a... You take a person who is a Hindu. You take a person who's a Buddhist. You take a person who is of the Islamic faith. And they come to you and they say to you, What must I do to be saved? You do not look at them and say to them what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. Because folks, they ain't even got started good through Lawrence County to make it to Lawrenceburg. They're in St. Joe. They need to be told, listen, first thing we got to do is sit down and create a faith and a belief system. Because for those who, who do not have any Christian faith, their, their faith their belief is into something or some being other than the God of heaven. You can't start with them on baptism. That, you can't do it. They're, they're, they're not there. They've still got some traveling to do. So how are you going to answer them? Well, you're going to sit down, you're going to talk with them, and you're going to find out where they are. And if it's the case that they like the... The Philippian jailer, what do you need to say to them? Well, the first thing you need to do, was that the totality of what they needed to do? Well, if it was, then why did Paul go on and baptize them, right? But notice the answer to the question. With that thought in mind then, back up to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, you know the setting, right? It's the day of Pentecost. We've got devout Jews who have traveled in from all over the world to Jerusalem, all over the known world, to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. There's a lot of things about Judaism that is, that is wrong. There's a lot of error to Judaism. But the one thing that is similar is that the Jews believed there was a Messiah coming. Unfortunately, a lot of them missed Him, didn't realize He was here. But they believed there was a Messiah coming to save the world. They had a faith in in the old law of Moses and the system of God that in the fullness of time, He was going to, as Galatians 4 tells us, send forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law. Now, again, they they were blinded to, to all of that occurring because it had all occurred. But interestingly enough, Peter, as a major part of his sermon, he goes back there in Acts chapter 2 and says, you remember what Joel said? Well, guys, it happened. 
And you remember this Jesus of Nazareth? You remember what you did to Him? You crucified Him. You know what God did to Him? He raised Him on the third day. He's gone back to the throne of glory. This Jesus that you crucified, God has set at the right hand of the throne of mercy. And to that sermon, they asked the question that David read in verse 37. Sirs, what must we do to be saved? To which Peter answered in verse 38, and and perhaps one of the first scriptures I ever learned from memory, Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, in order that you might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized. Well, now wait a minute. Paul told the Philippian jailer to believe. Now here Peter answers the question differently. He didn't say anything about believing. Why not? Because he's talking to a group of believers. You see, you've got to sit down and see where the person is. The Jews are not in St. Joe. The Jews are in Loretta. They're getting closer to Lawrenceburg. So now the answer is different. They're no longer 18 miles from the destination, they're now 12 to 10 miles, or 14 to 10 miles from the destination. And so the answer is different. You need to repent and be baptized. And thus they, according to Acts chapter 2, did exactly that, right? And about 3,000 souls were added. And finally tonight, for our study purposes, we go back to the 22nd chapter. Again, Saul is recounting his, Paul is recounting his conversion that took place in in Acts chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 9, he's on the road to Damascus, and he's telling us all that in Acts 22. And he tells us in verse 30, in verse 7 rather, excuse me, what the Lord said to him, and he asked a question, who are you, Lord? And Jesus of Nazareth answers verse 8, And this light blinds him in verse 10, he says, and David read the question, What shall I do, Lord? What shall I do? Well, the immediate answer that Saul received on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9 was from the Lord Himself when He said, Rise, go into Damascus, and there it will be told to you what to do. As you follow that context out, both in Acts chapter 9 and in Acts chapter 16, you know that Saul went on to meet a guy by the name of Ananias. And Ananias was told to teach to Saul the, what he must do. And verse 16 of Acts 22, as I read a while ago, Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Nothing about Believing, nothing about repenting. All we have recorded is Ananias saying to Saul, Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins. Again, a different answer. You say, well, it was part of the second answer. Okay, fair enough. But but it's not the totality of the second answer. And therefore, it's a different answer. What's the point? The point is that Saul was in Leoma. Saul was in Leoma. He was closer at the point that Ananias got to him. Why? Because, well, when you go back to Acts chapter 9, and you look at the, the full story or the full record of this, we learn in verse 9 of Acts 9 that for three days he was without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. And then it's verse 10 where the Lord calls to Ananias. And Ananias responds. And in verse 11, Jesus gives Ananias his instructions. And Acts chapter 9 and verse 11, the Bible tells us this. At the house of Judas, I want you to look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. He's praying. 
in the course of this three days that Saul was blinded, could I suggest to you that repentance had occurred? When he gets to Ananias, he is already, you can say by demand's sake, fair enough, because he's being led by the hand, because he can't even see where he's going. But regardless of what you conclude, he has been literally touched by the Lord, but also spiritually touched, to the point that he is already determined in his life to make some changes. And when Ananias gets him, his question is, Ananias, how do I get to Lawrenceburg, Tennessee? Ananias don't say, well, Saul, you're in St. Joe. You need to believe. Because you're 18 miles away. Nor does he say to Saul, well, Saul, you're in Loretta. You need to repent because you're still 12 miles away. No, what Ananias says to Saul is, Saul, you're in Leoma. You're getting real close to Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. You're only about five miles out. What you need to do is to be baptized, to wash away your sins. I believe tonight with all of my heart that we're all on the same road spiritually. We're just at different points on the road. And we say that amongst Christians. And we, we say, well, you know, your faith journey is at a different point than my faith journey is. And spiritually, we're in, we're in two different places. And fair enough. But I, I'm going to throw you a little curve here and, may, and hopefully help you think outside the box a little bit. The lost are on the same road. Spiritually. Oh, now wait a minute. How are the lost on the same road as a Christian spiritually? We're all going the same place, ain't we? No, it ain't heaven. It's judgment. It's judgment. We're all going the same place. According to Matthew 25, there will be none that will escape the judgment. We're all going the same place. There's only one way to get there. It's through living a physical life and dying. Which, oh, by the way, if you hadn't checked lately, that's what you're doing. And that's what everybody else in our world is doing. So guess what? They're on the same road you're on. They're just at a different place. They, they may be way back down the road, or they may be closer than you think. What's my point? My point is this. You've got to figure out where they're at on the road. It's mine and your responsibility to figure out where they're on the road. Because listen, if they're an unbeliever, you know what they need to hear? They need to hear what the Philippian jailer heard. You need to believe. You've got to start with belief. You can't go anywhere until you have first believed that there is a God. You take an atheist, for example. Don't go up to an atheist and say, Hey, you know what you need to do to be saved? You need to be baptized. Really? You're going to baptize an atheist without belief? Folks, you had not done anything to help him or her. No, you misunderstood where they were on the road, and you just got their clothes wet. That's all you did. It's our responsibility to understand where they're at on the road. And an atheist is, is, is way... They're, they're on the same road, but they're way back down the road doubting that God even exists. We've got to help them get to that point first. Philippian jailer, you need to believe in order to be saved. Because if you don't believe, there's no way you can be saved. Right? You believe that, don't you? You must first believe. And until there is, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. He that does not believe, that's where you got to start. So to an unbeliever, you got to get them to believe. If you're working with someone and they're on this journey and they're, they, they believe in God, they believe in Jesus, they believe in the cross, they believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, they believe in salvation found in Jesus, then, then you ain't got to look at them and say, hey, you need to believe. 
they're, they're, they're already there. What do you need to say to them? Well, you might need to say to them, has your belief convicted you to the point? You remember what the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2? They were, the King James Version says, pricked in their hearts. Some newer translations say they were cut to the heart. This person you're working with may be cut to the heart. That belief and that realization that I need to be in Christ, but I am outside of Christ, is cutting their heart. If that's where they're at on the road, spiritually, then what you need to say to them is, hey, the same thing Peter said to them. You need to repent and be baptized. You need to turn from from your sinful ways and sinful behaviors. You you need to separate yourself from Satan and the world and, and the friendships that you have that are leading you away from God. And you need to turn to God. That's what repentance is. And you need to find your all in all in God. And then you need to be baptized. You need to be washed in the blood of Jesus. What do you say to somebody who is a, we use this big word, penitent believer? Basically what we mean by, what do you say to someone who has come to a belief that has cut them to their heart to the point that they are ready to separate from their wicked ways? They've already determined in their life that they are ready to cut ties with their sinful nature and go in the direction toward God. They're on a different place in the road. What do you need to say to them? We don't need to tell them to repent. They've they've repented. You need to tell them what Ananias told Saul. You done made the decision to get your life right. The only thing you need now is the blood of Jesus. That's all you don't have. You need to be washed in the blood of Jesus. You have the faith. You have the foundation. You have the belief. You have the heart that has been touched to want to change. Now what do you need? You need washed. You need cleansed. So why don't you arise and be baptized? Wash away your sins in the blood of Jesus. For the remission of sins. Acts 2 And verse 38, what must we do to be saved? You better hear me. The answer could start differently for every person. You need to hear that and you need to hear all of it. When somebody asks you the question, what must I do to be saved? The answer could start differently for every person. Because it did in the Bible. It did in Scripture. No, there's, there's not a contradiction in the answers. What there is, is a different location on the spiritual journey for the ones asking the question. And thus, it requires a different answer. We're traveling. We're trying to get to heaven. That's our goal, isn't it? That's our destination. I'll ask you the question. Are you still on the journey? What point are you on the journey? Are you asking the question, what must I do to be saved? Are you asking that question? We need to determine what the answer is. And where to start. And how to get you to where God wants you to be. To get you on that journey. Maybe, maybe you're sitting there tonight and your GPS is recalculating. You know what that means? That means you took a wrong turn. It's recalculating. You've gotten off Highway 43 and now you're in the backwoods of nowhere. And it might be that your mind is recalculating. Be sure you get back on course before you end up in the wrong place. If we can help you with that, would you come right now as we stand and sing?